snack time. What have we got here? Some organic, 100% grass-fed whole milk yogurt. No artificial hormones, non-GMO. Organic, made from 100% grass-fed cows, certified, let's see, certified gluten-free. Oh, that's a lot of shit. What else we got in here? Um, King Arthur flour, premium, with higher protein, high rising, baked with joy. What the fuck is that? Um, milled from 100% select American grains. Hmm. What else have we got? Some sort of candy or cookies or something. Got some Cascadia Farm Organic. Friendly to the bees. Well, how the hell do I know that? Good cutting enhances the quality of good meat. In his way, the meat cutter is an artist. Poor cutting results in an inferior piece of meat, regardless of quality. What up, meatheads? This is Travis, American Butcher. In this episode, if you haven't already picked up by that amazing read that David did, it was riveting. Pre-intro is all about labeling. Yes, labeling. What you see on the finished package, how small producers circumvent it, and how large producers dictate what certain buzzwords mean and what you, the consumer, should look for. Be suspicious of and what you could do to ensure good quality in the future. Before I kick it off to David to continue with his amazing segment, I just want to say, please head over to iTunes, leave a five-star review, and please, please leave a comment. And here's David. Hey gang, David here. It's no secret that people shop with their eyes, right? Packaging is everything in the marketplace flooded with the same products, sometimes from the same production facility, but with just different labels. I mean, we do that where I work. Make the same bacon and just put different labels on it for different producers. It's kind of funny sometimes when you hear about how, you know, Uncle's Best Pork is better than um, Grandpa Timmy's old timey pork fatback bacon. It's all the same shit, right? Usually... You know, for me, when it comes to buying things, um, for the packaging anyways, I like minimalist packaging. Often it has words like organic, recycled, artisan, handcrafted, small batch, etc. Anyways, the point is, is that we shop with our eyes. And labeling and packaging is everything. All the world's finest young marketing minds are behind their standing desks, coming up with new effective terms to pander to our interests. How can we be sure we're getting what we think we're getting? One way is to become more aware of what terms are in fact regulated. Either the government, a third party, or some combination of the two have established a set criteria for producers and processors to be able to include certain terms on their for sale labels. In other words, if you want to be uh, in a position to put a USDA bug on your label, which enables you to wholesale to retailers or restaurants, You have to be able to play by their rules. I have with me here the Guide to Federal Food Labeling Requirements for Meat and Poultry Products, uh, courtesy of a generous FSIS inspector with whom I was discussing label approval recently. He just shared a few pages of the 800-some pages related to FDA and FSIS label regulations. Uh, For starter, in case you're wondering what the heck all these abbreviations are, here's a primer. The FDA is the United States Food and Drug Administration. They're basically charged with protecting the nation and, you know, the world's, all of our trading partners, food supply, uh, through control of the public health programs, food safety, tobacco, and pharmaceuticals. The USDA is the United States Department of Agriculture. They're responsible for writing federal, um, federal laws pertaining to farming, food processing, um food production, forestry, food safety, and all, you know, other agricultural ventures. 
FSIS is the agency that most of us deal with regularly in our business. They are an agency of the USDA, whose objective is to be responsible for the U.S., and therefore our business partners, commercial industry of meat, poultry, and egg production, and to ensure its safety and wholesomeness. They also call much of the shots when it comes to labeling, packaging, and the information allowed on both. I'd like to read you the introduction to this document that I just mentioned. This will kind of give you some insight into how the documents are worded, as well as the challenge that these agencies have with being super thorough while keeping it, you know, understandable, which oftentimes doesn't happen. So here's the, here's the uh, preface. The food label is important to food companies and consumers alike. A company's most direct and sometimes only way to communicate with the consumer is via the food label. For consumers, the food label contains a wealth of information which allows for informed purchase decisions. The U.S. Department of Agriculture, by statute, is charged with assuring that meat and poultry products in interstate or foreign commerce or that substantially affect such commerce are wholesome, not adulterated, properly marked, labeled, and packaged. Responsibility for the development and application of the labeling requirements applicable to meat and poultry products rests principally with the USDA's Food Safety and Inspection Service, or FSIS. FSIS is charged with developing the labeling policy by which it is determined if a meat or poultry product is misbranded or adulterated. Misbranding is, um, you know, where, like, let's say I've got some bullshit uh corn fed burned out milker that I bought from the stockyard and I'm going to like slaughter it and turn around and try to label it as grass fed organic beef illegally without the certification for those uh, label claims being grass fed and organic that is um, that would be a misbrand <clears throat> so anyways uh, FSIS food labeling regulations have evolved over the years reflecting the evolution of the food processing industry and consumer interest Food manufacturers are responsible for compliance with the FSIS labeling rules and adherence to the process maintained by FSIS for the evaluation and approval of meat and poultry product labels. You know, if, if you're out there misbranding things, they have um, inspectors called compliance officers or compliance investigators whose sole job is just to look into branding and make sure that people aren't trying to find loopholes in the system. So here, uh, this is from the same kind of collection, uh, same overall document. This is called the Introduction to Food Labeling. Again, it's it's a little esoteric, but it's pretty interesting. This section is titled "The Federal Agencies and Their Statutory Authority to Regulate Food Labeling." The federal regula reg regulatory agencies that have jurisdiction over food products derive their authority to govern the labeling of those products from seven. I'm sorry, from several principal statutes, the Federal Meat Inspection Act, the Poultry Products Inspection Act, the Egg, the Egg Products Inspection Act, the Agricultural Marketing Act, the, the uh, Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, and the Fair Packaging and Labeling Act. In addition, food advertising, which in certain instances serves as an extension of food labeling, is subject to regulation by the Federal Trade Commission under the Federal Trade Commission Act, which prohibits false and deceptive advertising. FSIS, as we previously mentioned, has primary responsibility for the regulation of food labeling for meat and poultry products under the FMIA and the PPIA, which is the Federal Meat Inspection Act and the Poultry Products Inspection Act, and is also authorized to regulate food labeling for exotic species of animals under the Agricultural Market Marketing Act of 1946. These, uh, these different acts define the food label in pertinent part as a display of written, printed, or graphic matter upon the immediate container of any article, and define labeling as all labels and other written, printed, or graphic manner upon any article or any of its containers or wrappers or accompanying such article. So if you want to add some, if you want to sneak in like a little, a little brochure with your meat or your whatever it is, um, that's still subject to the same rules, you know, add on shit after the fact, after it leaves the, the processing plant, you can't add that with, with whatever you want on it because that's still considered misbranding. USDA is authorized under these acts to regulate marketing, um, labeling or packaging of meat, poultry, or processed parts to prevent the use of any false or misleading mark label or container. 
This broad definition makes FSIS regulations applicable to product labels and materials that accompany a product but are not attached to it, such as as like a point of purchase material. The scope, you know, and that's like that's like um, accompanying marketing materials near or on the product in a retail environment. The scope of what constitutes a food label is discussed in great depth in this document. These food acts collectively specify the circumstances when products are misbranded. They provide in part that any carcass, meat, or meat product is misbranded if the label's labeling is false or misleading in any particular way, if it is offered for sale under the name of another food, if it is an imitation of another food unless it is labeled as such, and if its container is misleading unless it bears a label with the name of the manufacturer, distributor, and net quantity of contents, if its labeling is not prominent and conspicuous, and if it purports to be food with a standard of identity without conforming to the standard, if it misrepresents itself as a food with a standard of fill, if it does not bear a common or usual name, provided it is not covered by a standard of identity, and declare ingredients by a common or usual name, if it purports to be a food for special dietary use without conforming to FDA regulations on such products, if it contains artificial flavoring, artificial coloring, or chemical preservatives that are not declared, and if it fails to bear an inspection legend and establishment number. So all of these things have to be met for it to be legal. You know, it has to be what it says it is. It can't have a bunch of like weird chemical stuff in it without being clear. That label itself has to be totally conspicuous. You can't like hide a little sticker with a bunch of fine print under something. If a product is deemed in fact, misbranded, its manufacturer faces a wide range of penalties that can be imposed by the FSIS. These include withholding or rescinding the use of labeling, uh, product retention, prohibiting shipment, product detention, prohibiting sale from anywhere in the chain of commerce, requests for product recall, press releases, and or fines up to criminal prosecution. In addition, the facility producing misbranded product faces the possibility of inspection uh, suspension or withdrawal. Woohoo! That sure is some delicious regulatory scripture. Really gets me going, if you know what I mean. <laughs> all joking aside, uh, all of this can seem really sterile or esoteric if you aren't the HACCP coordinator or label specialist for your plant. I get it. It really does impact us a lot more than we think, though, you know, usually on a subconscious level as a consumer. Um, here's a situation that just happened to me recently. So I'm up north at a small farms conference, uh, which I was mostly there to do, you know, um, some networking for the processing plant that I manage and to gauge interest in a custom exempt mobile slaughter service that I may or may not be looking into. After the event, I decided to stop the local food co-op because, you know, this is the closest whole food style co-op within two hours of me. I mean, it's, it's two hours away. That's the closest one. Um, so I needed to stock up on my bulk items and B, I really wanted to uh, sell product to these guys and get in the co-op system. And so I wanted to scope, scope out the competition. Uh, I headed back to the meat section and began looking through the available items. And here's what I noticed. I noticed that there were three different beef suppliers, um, two of which were processed by me at our plant. The third one was at a, a competitor plant. All three um, were non-organic. And had no special claims that left my, you know, left the facilities. The two that left my facility were just generic labels, and it was the same uh, for the third brand. Now, the thing that I noticed, the sneaky thing, is that the establishment, the co-op itself, had added their own price tag that just happened to have a whole label full of special claims on all three of them. And they were some the same, some were different, but basically all of them were like grass-fed, organic or beyond organic, veganic, whatever the hell that bullshit means, um, non-GMO, no antibiotics, uh, grass-finished, you know, pastured, all of these special claims, highly regulated terms by the USDA and FSIS, were on the grocer's label. And nobody's inspecting that, you know, when it, once it leaves my facility and goes to the co-op, it has all the information it's supposed to have. They're just supposed to add a price tag, but they added all this extra bullshit at the obvious request to these producers. And it was a loophole, you know, um, 
it was really confusing to me, you know? And uh, I, I, just because I'm a stickler and like rules and things like that, kind of felt um, motivated to check with the, the local compliance officer. Um, I haven't yet, but I did take pictures of the things. You know, now because these farms are well-known, I mean, I know all, th- all, all three of these farms, uh, especially the two that I work with at, at the facility, I know for a fact that their operations are what they say they are. And those claims that are on those labels are actually true. You know, I mean, for the most part, I have verified all of them. So I'm not super worried about these products. But I do wish that they'd not cheat the system and pay for the proper certification. You know, it's like it kind of waters down the system. Um, You know, I guess I'm kind of biased. I've got certified organic grass-fed, grass-finished lamb here. And those claims are a big deal to me, you know, because I put the work in to comply with those things. And I pay for the marketing and I pay for the for the uh, label approval and, and the certification from third parties. And, and I think that when people kind of circumvent that and add these things, whether they're true or not, I kind of think that it waters down the trust that these third-party agencies um, build you know, like the American Grass Fed Association, people trust them. But when more people lie about having grass fed beef or they kind of add their own labels illegally, it really waters down their credibility, in my opinion. You know, so what What if you didn't know the farm on the label, I guess, is my next question. Um, here's a second instance when I stumbled across something uh, that was also misbranding, but was a little stranger. Um so I was on a different meat market somewhat recently and I was checking out the beef that they had and I noticed a producer. Now this producer has a, it's, this is somebody that I sell at the farmer's market with. Um, you know, they're another vendor. They've got a huge, you know, several hundred families. at meat CSA. They've got, they do meat bundles. They do farmer's markets. They've got retail. I mean, they'd have to have, they'd have to have at least, I don't know, I'd say 75 to 100 calves a year at least to keep this up. I mean, they probably would have to have 125 head of calves a year um, to keep this sort of production up. And everybody knows, I mean, the consumers don't know, but a lot of the people I know because I process all their animals, a lot of people in the industry know that they're swindlers. They just go to the local stockyard and pick up they pick up the lowest price shit they can possibly find week in and week out, and then they bring it to me to process. I condemn probably one carcass a month, and the ones that do make it through, I don't know, twenty percent of them um, are na- you know have they're riddled with parasites. They've got you know pneumonia, all, all kinds of different things, um, and it's a scam. You know, I mean. It drives me nuts and it drives everybody else nuts, you know. So so they market this beef as grass-fed, beyond organic, all this shit, you know, pastured, homegrown, uh, heritage breed, all this stuff. It's all a crock of shit. None of it's true. They don't have a single animal. Um, in fact, <laughs> I guess that they had a, a, a cow somewhat recently and they called our plant to ask, what do they do? Because she had her calf. Um, they didn't, they had no idea how to take care of it. And my bosses have been, uh, a dairy family and and a beef family for many, many decades. And and so they're kind of happy to help, but also, uh, appalled anyways. So I, so I, so I'm in this place. I notice this product from this particular producer. I pick it up and I'm taking a look at it. I recognize it. I cut it, you know, and the same thing that I noticed at the co-op, they've got this separate you know, after processor in the retailer's back room label that not only has the price, but has all these special claims on it. And this is awful because I know that they're all totally false. Um, and I guess this, this is this is the sort of thing that we, you know the compliance investigators go around and, and check for misbranding. And this and this is why they have regulatory bodies for these claims so that you can kind of keep these swindlers out of the business the best you can, I guess. 
Um, if I didn't already know this crook's reputation, I'd be tempted to try this beef, even though my brain would be saying, hey, fool, look at this shit. Um, that's not grass-fed organic. Anyways, I thought after hearing all of this, you might uh, be interested in hearing some regulated terms in our business, in the meat industry. There's hundreds of pages dedicated to this, but I'll just, I'll just pick some of the low-hanging fruit for you, and I'll try to pair them with some of their criteria um, to meet label approval. Um, so when it comes to product labeling, the use of animal raising claims on the labels of meat and poultry products have some criteria. Uh, although FSIS does not exercise its authority of prior label approval to point of purchase materials, like pamphlets, placards, stuff like that, um, FSIS does require these materials to be in accordance with federal regulations. Uh, labels bearing animal raising claims are required to be approved by FSIS prior to use in commerce. Uh, labels bearing animal raising claims are required to be submitted with specific documentation to support all animal raising claims that appear on the label. Examples of animals, animal raising claims include things like uh, raised without antibiotics, organic, grass-fed, free-range, raised without the use of hormones, you know, for most animal raising claims, the documentation typically needed to support these claims is um, a detailed written description explaining the controls used for ensuring that the raising claim is valid from birth to harvest or from the period of raising being referenced by the claim. A signed and dated document describing how these animals are raised. Um, for example, vegetarian fed, raised without antibiotics, grass fed, blah, 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 to support that the specific claim made is truthful and not misleading. Um, three, a written description of the product tracing and segregation mechanism from time of slaughter or further processing through packaging and wholesale or retail uh, distribution. You know, they, they want to know that your, this, these organic animals are being segregated from the conventional animals. Um, and that's something that we deal with. My processing plant is a, a certified organic plant, and we have to take a lot of steps to keep products separate. Um, you also have to generally supply a third party certificate, you know, like if you're going to say it's grass fed, you have to meet all those other requirements. And then you also have to have a sort of a certificate from the American grass fed association. Here's some examples of animal raising claims and the guidelines um, needed to substantiate the claims. Age of the animal age claims uh, are those that declare either the age of the animal or its developmental state. So example of this type of claim is like a 30 months of age or less beef, right? To reassure the com the, the customer that, you know, there's, there's no danger of uh, BSE in this. This is a young animal. It didn't get up to 30 months. You know, this is a T bone here. So like, don't worry that the spine is in it because it's not 30 months, whatever the documentation you need for that is a detailed written description explaining controls for ensuring that the age claim is valid from birth to harvest. Live animal production records, including a signed and dated document identifying the age of the animals that support the claim. A written description of the product tracing and segregation, segregation mechanism. So they, they want to know that, that the OTM beef, the over 30 months beef is going to be segregated. Um, the live animal production records need to demonstrate how individual animals or a group of animals are identifiable and traceable. So, you know, you need to you need to have tags on them and uh, birth records. Um, animal welfare and environmental stewardship claims. This is a big one on labels right now. These claims describe how animals are raised based on the care they receive by the producer, or the or how the producer maintains the land and replenishes the environment. FSIS does not define these claims and regulations or policy guidelines. For animal welfare claims, such as raised with care or humanely raised, FSIS will only approve a claim if a statement is provided on the label showing ownership and including an explanation of the meaning of the claim. Um, you know, so for example, like, you know, David Ranch defines raised with care as yada, 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 or Travis Farm defines sustainably raised as blah, blah, blah. Um, the claims may appear on any panel in the package. The definitions may appear with the claim or may be connected with by a symbol in place elsewhere, but they have to be on the label. Breed claims. This is a big one. Breed claims refer to the declaration of a specific breed of livestock or poultry. So examples of this are like Angus, Wagyu, American Kobe, Hereford, Berkshire, Duroc, Mangalitsa, you know, heritage poultry, what have you. 
you need to have a signed and dated document that substantiates the breed claim, um, a certificate from a breed organization to prove that it's purebred, a written description of the product tracing and segregation mechanism from time of slaughter or further processing so that you're keeping your, your breed away from other breeds, even after it's dead, and a document, documentation to support the breed by phenotype, for example, hide color or genotype, uh, for example, traceable to one registered parent or two registered grandparents with a breed association. So if I want to have, you know, if, if I want to market my Blueface Lester or Clone Forest lamb uh, on the label as such, I have to provide registered breed documentation to FSIS in order to get label approval. Diet. Diet claims refer to what animals are fed prior to harvest or processing. These claims require that the animals only eat the diet claimed for that lifetime of the animal, and the exception of milk consumed um, prior to weaning can be, that can be kind of fit in. That can count. Grass-fed or 100% grass-fed claims may only be applied to meat and meat product labels derived from cattle that were only 100% fed grass or forage after being weaned from their mother's milk. The diet must be derived solely from forage, and animals cannot be fed grain or grain byproducts and must have continuous access to pasture during the growing season until slaughter. Forage consists of grass, annual or perennial, forbs, which are like Forbes are kind of like herbs or um, brassicas or chicory or anything that's that's kind of like a beneficial supplement. Um, legumes. Uh, and interestingly enough, cereal grain crops, as long as they are in the vegetative pre-grain state. So you can have them out on a field of rye or wheat or whatever, you know, corn if you want, as long as it does not go to seed or produce any seed heads whatsoever. Hay, haylage, baleage, silage, crop residue without grain, and other roughage sources may be included as acceptable feed sources. You know, so if you had a way to put beef out on a cornfield after harvest so they can chew on the corn stover and somehow document that you can ensure that they've not gotten any kernels of corn, that could potentially work. Um... Routine mineral and vitamin supplementation may also be included in the feeding regimen. If incidental supplementation occurs due to inadvertent exposure to non-forage feedstuffs or to ensure the animal's well-being at all times during adverse environmental or physical conditions, the producer should pro provide a signed and dated affidavit to the establishment attesting the above incident is not a routine occurrence. Um, the establishment should include this information as part of the label, labeling documentation, verifying the product meets the grass fed claim. So, you know, if, if all, if all my steers bust through the fence and jump over to the cornfield, I can provide an affidavit that says like, this was a total accident. This would never happen. Or if a flood comes through and destroys all the pasture and you have to supplement with something that's, you know, not normally acceptable, um, that can, that can kind of work as a loophole, but it, they have to be very confident that, it was a one-time occurrence. Believe it or not, there's, I mean, there's, there's so many more pages of this. Um, they've got, they, they've regulated raising conditions, living conditions, raised without antibiotics pol in poultry and um, in red meat in their separate regulations, raised without hormones, source, traceability. Um, traceability is the type of claim that demonstrates how the animal can be traced back to its farm of origin from birth to slaughter and harvest. You know, third-party certifications of all kinds. There's so many hundreds of pages, and uh, these are just a few. But hopefully that kind of gives you uh, an idea of how all of these terms come to fruition. Um, and maybe in, in the future we can go over, get more in-depth on some of these regulated terms. But um, next time you're in the grocery store, take a look at the, at the products that you're looking, especially meat and poultry and eggs, and, and look at, like, all the bullshit that gets put on a label that's not regulated and cannot be proven, such as like grown outside under the sunshine and the good feelings, you know, shit like that. That's just meant to make you feel good about buying stuff. See through it or try to see through it and uh, base your decisions on, you know, things that you like or if you're more concerned, claims that can be verified. I just want to give my perspective on some of the things that David mentioned. I can completely understand the frustration of being a small farm, paying premium money 
to get that certified organic. And I think it is kind of weak when other farms just put that on there after the fact, who may not be misleading the public, but are certainly not playing by the rules. It is hard for an open market to decide when everyone's not playing on an even field. Be that money for third-party audits, be that money for good animal husbandry, or weather and crops, and accessibility. The term local itself. I often think of the Portlandia skit about the chicken when discussing what local is. Working in Vermont, when people would say things were local, that would mean it would genuinely come from the state of Vermont. Then when I moved out to manage a shop in Southern California, the term local that we use meant all our animals are local to the state of California. Well, the state of California is pretty fucking big. And if you have animals being raised in Southern California near San Diego, but yet the closest USDA slaughter facility is in San Francisco, and you have to haul them just so our listeners know that's about an eight-hour drive, and then bring them back to San Diego to process them to do the cutting and wrapping of these carcasses, is that still considered local? If you put local on your label, at what point does it not become local? How big does your company need to be until it's selling outside of what it would be considered its local market? The carbon footprint alone of hauling these animals to Northern California, then back to Southern California, then delivering the finished product as far north as San Luis Obispo is something that should also be in consideration when why are you buying that local product? Is it to support small local businesses or is it to help diminish a carbon footprint? And you may hear this and say, how do I know where the animals are raised and how do I know where they're processed? Well, a USDA label, what or what the USDA requires on a label is a plant identifier, a bug, and you could run multiple companies out of a plant. So like a plant that does, uh, you know, steaks or cut and wrap can also sell a organic certified USDA dog food, uh, but may change the company's name in the fine print. So it's not saying like, oh, beefsteak plant also makes dog food. Well, I'm not going to buy their steaks because they're a dog food company. But that bug will tell you what the plant is. And then also there's going to have to be contact information with a street address and accompanied by a phone number, how to get a hold of these plants. And what you do is you ask them, where does your product come from? And hopefully, they, if they're not transparent, then I would recommend not buying from them. You could also reach out to the farmers if that's also to ensure that you're uh, satisfied. Where we live today, or the time we live in, people are buying products not on necessarily the product itself, the taste. And this is just to me. People are buying that story behind it. Not all people, just, you know, the um, a certain percentage of people are, are shopping by buzzwords. I know I certainly do, um, not even with me, with a lot of products. Um, we use Honest Company diapers here in my house. Do you know why? Because the Honest Company, it, it's better than the other companies because they're honest. So words that meant nothing for a long time that were easily interchangeable, all natural. What does natural even mean? If you were to even think about it, matter itself, all existing, whatever shape or form it is, is still natural. It all came from earth. Uranium, helium, and hydrogen, and sulfur are all natural. So I appreciate that a definitive definition being implemented. A natural product contains no artificial ingredients or additives or color. There's also many processing steps to ensure that this is uh, done correctly and documented. Also, it has to be minutely processed. What does that mean? You know, there's no mechanical separation, uh, things of that nature. The term fresh, never frozen. I worked retail. We would get these birds that were obviously frozen. And I would go and pick them up. And there's no signs of processing. And they were supposed to be processed the day before. And they, I thought it was because of... uh, 
they used slush bins and but slush bins wouldn't uh, freeze the internal meat. Uh, if you don't know what a slush bin is, it's a big container with a slush solution of ice and water and um, usually a uh, antimicrobial intervention to help get the birds down to temperature. Small processors do this. Uh, I've worked with one small small processor that did air chill birds that would uh, essentially freeze almost flash freeze them to get them down to temp before you package them because you have four hours from your slaughtering process to get it down below, uh, I think, 41 degrees uh, or 40 degrees. I don't know. I haven't done that in years. So uh, if that number's wrong, I don't really need your feedback. So I would go and pick up these birds and I would open up the box and they would be hard and I would have to bone them out for customers and it it would suck because we'd pick them up on uh, Wednesday morning and we'd have customers ready uh, by Wednesday afternoon and boning out partially thawed birds is a fucking nightmare. I don't recommend it. And it's like, how could people get away or how could they say that they're, they're fresh poultry, you know? And well, it's simple. That the term means whole birds or cuts of birds have never been kept below 26 degrees. Now, most food safety programs allow you to go within two degrees left or right uh, as far as thermometer calibration. And if there's something off, then these birds would end up being par frozen. So I don't know if this was done maliciously to give a longer shelf life. But these birds were always dated as if they were processed the day before. But this was also done by a small, custom-exempt poultry outlet where there is very little oversight. And they were later fined or written up by the uh, California Department of Agriculture and the USDA for processing outside of their realm of practice by doing above and beyond what they were legally allowed to within the time frame they were allowed to. And chicken... And poultry have a incredibly short shelf life. So when you're able to buy a fresh chicken from a small processor, you could expect to pay an exorbitant amount of money per pound on this. When I used to run a chicken slaughter facility, we would have to put whether it was an old bird or a mature bird. And the cutoff for that is 16 weeks. When uh, Moving on to Thanksgiving, we'd put whether or not it was a hen or a tom. And these were all labeling claims that the USDA helped ensure that we were doing uh, through paperwork from the farmer and through anti-mortem inspections. Now, another place where uh, documentation from the farmer is very key is in preventing BSC through the detection of SRM, where this is a age-sensitive issue. So relying on birth affidavits from the farmer Uh, will trump anything as far as um, dentition. So if you didn't know, and you could always go back to our uh, Mad Cow episode, that BSE, bovine, whatever, I I, I would stutter if I try to say it, um, just type it in and Google it, is what causes Mad Cow disease and transfer to humans. But this only starts getting detected in cattle after 30 months of age. And the way you could tell this is if you don't have that paperwork from your farmer is the people on the kill floor should be trained to do dentition where you have baby teeth and adult teeth. And you have to have, uh, you know, one solid set of adult teeth with the other ones breaking the surface. That means it is over 30 months if you only have one set of adult teeth and no other ones breaking the surface, then the animal is under 30 months. So farmers genuinely don't want to have an animal that is over 30 months because the spinal column would be removed, which would mean you don't get your uh, T-bones. Uh, it makes bone and ribeyes way more difficult, and it makes processing way more difficult. And some processors add on an extra fee for because it's going to be slower because you have to be concerned with spreading around this prion that 
really hasn't existed in North America um, since the late 90s. Uh, and the reason that the law isn't getting changed as far as BSE is because of our export to Asian countries have a higher standard. And for us to be a competitive market, we have to meet their standard. So birth affidavit. This is just something, this is a piece of paper that the farmer has that say when the animal was born, with the farmer's signature on it. Sounds pretty legit, right? Well, you could write this on a post-it. You could write this on a piece of legal paper. And the way the rules are set up is that when it is handed in, it is to be more uh, of a binding document than the teeth themselves. This loophole was pointed out to me by a USDA inspector who kind of indicated that, well, if the farmer doesn't have their paperwork, just have them go out to their car and fill it out. This is also important during the slaughtering process for your order of uh, processing. So if you have, if you're processing and you have your second beef you do is over 30 months of age, you have to do a complete sanitation cycle before you move on to the next beef. So you always want to do your OTMs or your over 30 months at the end of the day. So you don't have to do that sanitation cycle. Now, that being said, you would think if one, say you did five OTMs at the end of the day, are you supposed to do a sanitation cycle in between each one? Because one may have a BSE, but the other ones may not. Well, again, uh, those are just things that you should discuss uh, for yourselves and not bring it up with your USDA because they may make you do that. And maybe you should be doing that. But if you just label everything as OTM, it makes it way easier if you're like a burger factory where it, it doesn't really matter. Besides the processing and crossing the, the spinal vertebral column with the saw. David mentioned briefly compliance officers. In a USDA compliance officer, he's, he's a detective. He could be at a store and read a package and say, that seems incorrect, and then bust them that way. And I know that's how places have gotten labeling issues before, was that a compliance officer just happened to be doing his regular grocery shopping. There are regular people that need to eat as well. Now, my brother is a butcher. I met my wife at a butcher shop. She knows how to break down animals. I would call her a butcher, even though she's back into banking. Her brother is a butcher. And her uncle is a retired butcher and, re and a retired compliance officer from the USDA. So at family events, I get talking to him and I ask him, let's just call him Kim because I don't want to give his real name. And I was like, so what was a compliance officer or what did you do? What is a compliance officer? And he would tell me about some of his more interesting case cases that he got word that a a uh, cattle operation was processing downers and uh, like that. So he went out, he grew a beard, him being a butcher. He went and got a job, a entry level job at this plant. He had a name and everything and a paycheck and he would be an employee at this establishment. Uh, like he was Leonardo DiCaprio in the departed, but slaughter facilities usually aren't welcoming with their secrets to the new guy. So when there was a bunch of downers and dead cows in the pens, one day he injected them with ultraviolet ink. And then the next day he showed up, went into the cut room with the light, and could tell that these animals were processed later that evening. He filled out a report, contacted the frontline supervisor, and shut the facility down. Another story he told me about being a compliance officer was he just happened to be walking in a rural area where he knew there was a poultry operation and saw someone walking away from that plant with a bag of red chicken. Out of curiosity and not on the clock, he asked, what's the deal with that uh, chicken? Where did you get it? And the person told him, oh, uh, every Friday and Saturday, you could buy pre-seasoned chicken up from the factory. Because of his vocation and knowing what that plant's operation was like, he felt there was something wrong. So he started an investigation. He discovered that the plant was using a pink or reddish denaturant 
to put on their product. Four condemned animals that were suited as non-edible by the USDA. So birds with abscess, broken wings that were trimmed off, jelly belly, aseptosemia, and other terrible things that birds get. They were removed from the rail and put into a giant bin where they were poured red denaturin on. Someone thought it was a great idea to take Spanish seasoning, like red uh, chicken seasoning you would buy from like a carniceria, and cover this denaturant with that. Then sell it by word of mouth to the surrounding less fortunate community. These are just the most outrageous stories he told me in an overall 20-year career with the United States Department of Agriculture. Maybe one day I'll get him to come on the show, but I doubt he will. Matt Lever asked me would I ever work for the USDA when I retired, and I said no. That's not true. I probably would be a compliance officer. This next piece is by Ryan. As it stands right now, in 2018, certain labeling claims found on meat products are at best ambiguous in their definitions. For example, I'll focus on two of them, humanely raised and handled, and sustainably raised. These are claims that have no legal USDA definition. Their exact meaning is vague. It is unclear. This is because there are different schools of thought on what humane treatment is. At one extreme end of the spectrum, PETA says that, in their opinion, there is no such thing as humanely raised meat. Businesses big and small alike that use this claim of humanely raised and handled, sustainably raised, often provide a one or two sentence summary of what humanely raised means, but the conversation rarely goes any deeper than that. Quote, the animals receive adequate space to roam. This phrase is commonly offered to describe humane treatment, but it is problematic because adequate space to roam could mean any number of things. These are very slippery words that are open to interpretation. Many claims start out unclear in their definition until eventually, over time, a concrete legal definition is chiseled out. This is often a result of lawsuits and other consumer pressures that spotlight the issue. In the case of humanely raised and sustainably raised, part of the problem here is that these claims refer to farming and ranching methodology, which is a topic vast in scope and infinitely complicated. Even the best, most ethically-minded farmers will disagree with each other on the very basics of livestock husbandry. For example, how long do you keep calves together with their mothers before you wean them? Should you herd animals with dogs? and four-wheelers from behind them, or lead them from the front with a daily feed call and an open gate to new pasture? What amount of antibiotics and dewormers should be given? What kind of grazing and fencing strategy is optimal? Is it best to graze with a mixed species herd or to use a leader-follower system, or to just focus on one animal type per grazing operation? What stock density is optimal for the animals? What stocking density is optimal for the land? Proponents of ultra-high stock density grazing will tightly mob their herds with electric fencing, sometimes bunching them up to 1 million pounds per acre. This means that the animals are made to bunch very, very close together, trampling grasses and competing with each other for the best and sweetest forages. One farmer might look at this and say this management technique is best practice for the health of the animals and the health of the land. Meanwhile, the farmer next door might view this as unnecessary stress upon the animals and inhumane treatment. Who's correct? 
There are many schools of thought on best practice, humane handling, and sustainability. The Animal Welfare Institute, the AWI, decided to tackle the issue of animal welfare labeling claims made by USDA companies. They asked these companies to provide documentation to substantiate claims such as humanely raised and handled and sustainably farmed. After five years of investigating 25 different companies, they released a report on their findings. I'll read next from a 2014 Times Magazine article by Catherine Harmon Courage. The findings suggest that whether or not the animals in question are actually being raised humanely or in an eco-friendly manner, there are big gaps in verifying those claims and giving consumers access to that information. Quote, we're not suggesting that all these claims are misleading or that the claims we reviewed were misused, says Dina Jones, manager of AWI's Farm Animal Program. Quote, but that's the problem. We don't know, she notes. That doesn't give any assurance to the consumer. In the five cases in which AWI did receive relevant documents about labeling claims, the evidence, in Jones' opinion, was inadequate, often consisting of a one- or two-sentence statement by the company that the animals were being raised appropriately and no additional information about animal cage size, feed, or water quality. These claims are considered added value, Jones says, and people pay top dollar because of them. For example, the online grocery service, Fresh Direct, sells its own brand of boneless, skinless chicken breast cutlets raised without antibiotics for $6.99 per pound, whereas they sell a humanely raised and organic competitors' cutlets for eleven ninety nine per pound. Quote, to most people, these claims mean you're getting something above the standard of conventional industry. And with such prices at stake, companies should have to prove it, she says. Indeed, these labels have become a major selling point with consumers. Quote, the larger conventional meat companies... They see the success that our sector has had, says Christopher Eli, co-founder and farmer liaison for Applegate, which makes meat and dairy products, many of which are certified organic, and they want a piece of the warm and fuzzy meat pie. Everybody is jumping in. Many companies do pay an outside organization such as Certified Humane or Global Animal Partnership to supply guidelines and perform audits to make sure their practices are in line with the statements on their labels. The third-party labels that AWI cites as trustworthy are Animal Welfare Approved, American Humane Certified, Certified Humane, Food Alliance, USDA Certified Organic, and GAP, which verifies products sold at Whole Foods Market. But other companies may feel empowered to make exaggerated or very vague claims, Jones notes, and the various certification groups have distinct standards for what many of these terms require. There aren't scientifically established and consumer agreed upon definitions for humanely raised or sustainably raised, says Lindy Miller, an agriculture extension educator at Purdue University. So it becomes very hard to write or enforce regulations. This leaves the marketplace in moderate chaos, as it was a couple decades ago for the term organic, before the USDA took over a centralized labeling program. Simply Arriving at a unified definition of organic took years and resulted in hundreds of pages of regulatory documents. Terms such as humane and sustainable are far murkier and open to interpretation. It's not like cage-free or free-range, which have relatively specific self-explanatory implications, says Jones. 
ensuring accountability for how an animal was raised becomes even more complicated because the company requesting USDA label approval is rarely the same one that has actually raised the animal. Most major distributors buy their animals from suppliers all over the country. Applegate, for example, might acquire animals from 1,500 different individual farms this year alone, Eli notes. And the USDA, which is tasked mainly with ensuring that food is safe and unadulterated, quote, does not have authority to regulate animal raising facilities says Catherine Cochran, a USDA spokesperson, adding that they do, quote, require processors to substantiate that they meet the claims presented on their product labels. Let me reiterate that last point. Most medium and large scale companies buy their animals from all over the country and from multiple suppliers. The USDA has many good tools in place for overseeing handling and humane treatment at the processing and production facility, but there are not as many tools in place to substantiate claims made about how the animals' lives were managed. At the company where I currently work, we provide USDA mobile slaughter services and USDA cut and wrap for small farmers within roughly a 100-mile range from our facility. We work with many hobby farmers that make no profit. And also several very successful niche market farmers. It's very interesting to observe the strategies employed by the successful enterprises. For small farmers... Labeling and marketing seems to make the biggest difference in whose meat is in most demand. One might think that the most proficient or the most expert grazers and finishers might have the most fame or make the most money from their livestock operations. This is not the case. There's usually very little correlation linking the expert farmer with the best profit margins or with demand for their product even. Far and away, it is those farmers that have the smartest, most dialed in marketing strategies that sell the most and take home the most money at the end of the day. One of the most successful family farming operations we work with started their ranching in midlife, husband and wife, and they immediately focused on setting up a savvy marketing strategy. They pursued organic certification right off the bat. They incorporated Wagyu genetics into their 100% grass-fed Black Angus herd. My hat is off to the work that they've done. They have now found their way into many of the hippest and busiest farmer's markets in our region and into many, many grocery stores and restaurants. Their beef is very good at times, but it is certainly not the best or highest quality beef we see coming through, moving through our facility. Yet theirs is in very, very high demand and widely considered by local consumers to be the highest quality available. Theirs is a useful case study. It is a strong example of how Success often stems from weaving an appealing story and thereby influencing the perceptions of the consumer. And it is the labeling claims that do the heavy lifting for businesses as they attempt to weave their stories and market their products. Humane handling. It is a very subjective term. And the people who make this these rules on it as far as labeling aren't necessarily the USDA. They are third parties that created their own standard that correspond with other companies that they help represent. Say I want to sell to Whole Foods as a, uh, as a farmer. So I would call up the company Sterotech or something like Sterotech and they would come out to see that I meet 
uh, whole food standards as far as cleanliness, as far as labeling, as far as HACCP and food safety. Now, there are companies that do this exact same thing. And to be considered uh, proficient in humane handling, there is a way to do it that fits in to the specs that these companies develop. But then again, those specs are completely subjective and may not be considered humane by other people. I myself have my humane handling certificate through a program developed by Eric Wagner and with partnership by Temple Grandin. After years and years of working with animals, I have also just intuitively know where to stand, how to manipulate animals, what to read the situation, and their stress. Now, a third-party program developed by someone with humane handling may allow you to use a cattle prod in a quote-unquote humane way. The places where using a cattle prod are not humane is in the face, in the udders, in the genitalia, or using water assist to get better connectivity. Those would all be considered egregious, along with twisting tails to get animals to manipulate, and I don't advocate for anyone to do those things. But as far as using a cattle prod correctly in the rump to get an animal to move forward where it's just like a little tickle, I personally don't find a problem with this. Animals move because they don't want to be next to either you, the cattle prod, a rattle paddle, a sorting board, or a grocery bag tied onto a stick and waved behind their eyes, we would call this the ghost. You are making the animal un- uncomfortable, and its immediate reward is getting away from you and thinking to itself, do you know what? Fuck this guy waving a plastic bag in my face. All these things introduce some level of stress that could be read in one form or another. A friend of mine, Sean Kelly, recently posted a video on his Instagram account, Short Loin, of him offloading what I believe was a Jersey cow. And let me describe this 30-second video to you. It's a trailer, a drop trailer, where the back folds down to make an even ramp, and the animal is skidges to get off. Through my humane handling training through a third party who eventually audited me so I could sell directly to Whole Foods, I learned the contrast is what animals don't like. The contrast from the wood-colored unloading ramp to the dark concrete, the animal thinks it is stepping off into a hole. That, with the stress of manipulating the animal in a trailer and getting it to its destination, perceived like the animal was scared. When I watched the video, I just saw an animal that was apprehensive. It was weary of the ramp. It was weary of the concrete. It got halfway down the ramp and then did a little jump to finish getting off all the way. This indicating that its issue was the contrast and not with what was happening. As far as being at a slaughter facility or smelling death in the air. What could have made this go smoother was throwing some bedding on the ramp and the concrete to make it all one smooth transition, or having a trailer with a side door that allowed you to get behind the animal and ride that blind spot about 45 degrees behind their eye. They will be irritated and walk in a straight line away from you. But the comments on this video were people saying, how dare you? This animal is obviously scared, and this shouldn't be shown, and etc., and etc., and this is inhumane, and blah, 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 blah. And that's why it is hard to argue a subjective opinion, even though that is most of my job. in and out in my opinion, is the best hamburger in the world. And when someone says they've had better, I immediately want to say you're fucking wrong. But I can't prove that, because I can't prove the way they feel. Anyway, I guess this show was about labeling. And what you could do to ensure you get good product is if that that's something you really want to do is understand what these words mean in the eyes of the USDA and 
that information might not always be easy to find, but in the show notes, I will put a link to some of the terminology and what it means. Took my first breath where the muddy grasses spills into the Gulf of Mexico and the skyline's colored by chemical plants to put bread on the table of the working man where the working man does his best to provide safety and shelter for kids and a wife giving a little of a soul every day making overtime All right, meatheads, that's going to do it for this week's episode of the Meat Block Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. It was a long one, but I also think it was an important one. And remember, if you're trying to live by what it says on the package, always approach it with a skeptical eye or a grain of salt. And as the consumer, never be afraid to ask questions. Because at the end of the day, you have to trust what you're putting in your body and what you're feeding to your family. But anyway, if you want to contact us, you can do so by emailing us at themeatblockpodcast at gmail.com. You could tweet us at themeatblockpod or Instagram at themeatblock. We also have a Facebook group, The Meat Block, and there is a lot of great conversation happening over there. And if you want to get a hold of us individually, let's say Ryan, you could hit him up at gather and break on instagram david at a farm butcher on instagram and i am of course american butcher on instagram and facebook and now vimo virgo or or whatever that new one that is supposed to answer all your problems and have a updated timeline but also still your information and sells it to ad companies and if you're looking for a way to support the show no i'm not going to ask you to do a patreon or give me money All I'm going to ask is that you type in The Meat Block in whatever podcast uh, listening device you are using, such as Apple Podcasts, and leave a comment. And please, please leave five stars. Another way to support the show is to tag us on social media, just like Chef Brian Young, uh, Norm the Butcher, and a big shout out to everyone who's continuing to do it, mostly wild and free, uh, Simon the Butcher, good luck in the WBC, and many, many more. Our outro song is Keep the Wolves Away by Uncle Lucius. Now, I love this song, even though it falls into the newer category of country music. Just on this whole fact that I consider myself working class, I like working until it feels like my bones are about to break. One of my favorite things to do is brag about how hard I work. And how much I feel like shit. Whenever someone asks me how I am, I always say that I'm tired. And now that I'm married with a child, I have more of a romanticized idea of what songs like this and many others are. I believe they're talking to me directly. And that's the whole point of music and what I listen to. Is that you want to put yourself into the mindset of the singer or the artist. Much like how POV is my favorite. So is storytelling country. Anyway, keep your knife sharp and live in the margin. Mm-hmm.